Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Earlier this year, we hit a major milestone in the future of pediatric research for our region and beyond, the grand opening of the Children's Mercy Research Institute, a new state-of-the-art research building that supports a collaborative approach to team science where physicians, scientists, and others working together to find the answers to pediatric medicine's most challenging questions. Children's Mercy is recognized by the National Cancer Institute as a consortium partner of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Together, we are working to advance childhood cancer research. Good morning. I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. And with me this morning is Dr. Tom Curran, executive director and chief scientific officer of the Children's Mercy Research Institute, and Dr. Stephen Leader, deputy director uh, of the Institute. And joining us uh, via Skype is our own uh, Alex Dinkel, a member of the Cancer Center's investigator-initiated teams uh, uh, unit and a childhood cancer survivor. Dr. Curran, I'm going to talk uh, first with you. And can you tell us more about the um, Children's Mercy Research Institute and kind of what your plans are for the uh, future of that? Well, it's really an exciting time, Roy, and uh, you and I have been planning this for, for years now, but the reality uh, transcends even our wildest dreams. Uh, really, it was the generosity of the Hall Family Found Foundation, the Sunderland Family Foundation, that allowed us to build this, this remarkable uh, building and recruit some of the best and brightest. So we just opened. Uh, despite COVID, people are working in the space, uh, socially distanced, of course, and we're really looking at various plans for recruitments, particularly in the cancer area right now. We have the great space. We have a, a GMP facility to support potential immunotherapeutic development. And we have this great genome center. Uh, and again, because of the generosity of the Kansas City uh, local population, uh, particularly the folks from Big Slick, we're able to offer cancer genomics to all patients who come to, to Children's Mercy uh, as part of our uh, oncology service. That's really fantastic. Uh, Alex, you bring a unique perspective uh, to our conversation uh, this morning. Could you tell us about your cancer journey and what the new Children's Mercy Research Institute means to you? Sure. I mean, to me, as a cancer survivor, I think it brings about a great uh, opportunity, of course, to the region and metro. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 16 with a rare form of Ewing sarcoma uh, in the lower skull base uh, of my brain and underwent numerous surgeries, radiation, and chemotherapy. Um, not only that, but I was a part of an NCI-designated clinical trial. Uh, my oncologist and my family chose to forego the normal standard of care treatment at that time, instead to go with this research trial that had shown success in young, healthy patients with localized Ewing's. Um, you know, it made a significant impact on me, made a significant impact on what is now the standard of care treatment for patients with uh, localized Ewing sarcoma. So having this research center and this beautiful facility to help not only Kansas City, but I think the region overall and everyone around us, it brings about a whole renewed sense of hope. Um, and of course, maybe a bright future for what is to come for cancer research, especially for pediatrics. Well, thanks so much uh, for sharing, Alex. I think your story really helps to underscore uh, the critical importance of, of pediatric cancer uh, research. And uh, your story kind of has an interesting twist that we'll get to uh, in, in a little bit here. But uh, uh, right now, I want to uh, ask Dr. Leader, um, I, I know pediatric research is underfunded. And could you tell us 
more about how that's affected kids and how the Institute is really trying to change that? Uh, yes, well, th thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to uh, participate um, in this um, uh, podcast. Um, I think one of the things that um, generally is not appreciated is um, the fact that a lot of medications that are used to treat um, um, conditions, medical conditions in um, children are not actually developed for the express purpose of the, uh, the condition in the, the pediatric population. They tend to be um, um, medications that uh, have been developed for adult conditions that sound similar to uh, what's experienced by, uh, by kids. So the, the investigations that uh, go into those medications are done in adults and not in children, and yet that's the, uh, the, uh, the sort of ammunition that we have to, um, um, to use. The, the part that we are trying to um, address at uh, the Children's Mercy Research Institute is the reality that um, children with asthma uh, grow up to be adults with asthma. Um, children with um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder grow up to be adults with the condition. And more and more so, children who are diagnosed with uh, cancer grow up to be adults with cancer. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we really need to start to think about how we can invest in research that is targeted at children because there's the possibility that we could impact the disease in a way that changes the course of, um, of uh, what's experienced in adulthood. And that's really what we want to go after. Mm -hmm. So as um, Dr. Curran alluded to, from the be very beginning of the planning of this uh, facility, we knew that really precision therapeutics, genomics was going to be a major focus for the Children's Mercy Research Institute. And uh, your career really kind of presaged, uh, you know, so much of this whole line of, of thinking. Could you tell us about your uh, uh, grant that funds the Goldilocks uh, Research Initiative and kind of how that uh, relates to all of this? Oh, absolutely. I think we all recognize that uh, each patient is uh, unique. And uh, with the advent of newer genomic tools and appreciation of um, other factors that contribute to making us unique, and in the context of children, this is the stage of uh, development. We know that newborns are different than um, toddlers or preteens and adolescents. Um, and the whole concept behind Goldilocks is trying to figure out what factors make each child unique so that we can come up with the, uh, the, the dose that's, uh, as you might, might guess, is not too big, not too small, but just right for that particular patient. Um, I would have to say, though, that as much as we realize that, that genetics or genomics make a person unique, and that's the G of Goldilocks and stage of development or ontogeny, the O, um, we, we understand those things, but we, we really don't understand how you put it together so that a clinician can um, decide what is the right uh, medication and dose for a particular patient. And our realization of the um, uh, extent of the problem and how it should be approached came from that Goldilocks grant. And it was actually um, a study that was done um, with um, a drug called uh, Sterterra to treat um, ADHD, where we gave um, a group of children the same dose and we adjusted that dose based on their body weight. Um, this was the starting dose that's recommended by the Food and Drug Administration. And what we found was that um, uh, even though we were giving everybody the same weight-based dose, not everybody was getting the same amount of drug in the system, what we call the systemic exposure. And in fact, it varied 50-fold, 50-fold between um, the child who got the, um, the highest exposure and, and the one who got the lowest exposure, all getting the same half a milligram per kilogram of body weight dose. And so that prompted, we knew what some of the factors were. But the more important question was, well, how do we take that into consideration? That was one question. The other question was, well, how big is that um, range in exposures for the, for the drugs that we give to treat other conditions, especially cancer? And can we build tools that allow us to um, um, do a better job? So that's the basic concept. 
So I got to ask you, how, did, did it take you as long to figure out the title of your grant that corresponded <laughs> to the spelling of Goldilocks as it did to write the grant? Well, the <laughs> the uh, the whole idea of Goldilocks that was uh, I I was laid up in bed for two days and staring at the ceiling, and uh, you know the challenge was I've always had difficult difficulty explaining to people, especially my family, you know what it is that you do if you're a, a pediatric clinical pharmacologist, for example. And, and um, um, we had just become grandparents and were reading stories to the kids, and, and uh, one of them was Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and that's when it kind of uh, clicked. It's, it's rather than say, to say that, um, you know, I, I'm interested in the relative contribution of genomics and ontogeny to drug uh, and dose individualization, it was easy to say, Goldilocks, not too big, not too small, just right. There you go. So, Dr. Curran, uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the flagship uh, genomics uh, project uh, for the Research Institute, which is the Genomic Answers for Kids? Sure, Ryan. You know, um, children with rare diseases and families who have children with rare diseases often go through a prolonged odyssey, going from clinic to clinic, institution to institution, test after test, trying to figure out what, what's wrong, what causes their condition. Of the 8,000 rare diseases, 7,000 manifest in children. So this is more prevalent than you might think because you add together thousands of rare diseases and you have relatively common conditions. So we challenged the head of the Genome Center, Tommy Pastinen, to come up with a way that would really move the needle knowing we could go to the community and ask for support. And he devised the Genome Answers for Kids project, which allows any physician to, to, to request a genomics test on a patient where they think that information would benefit the patient. That patient can then be entered onto a clinical trial where the service is, is provided at, at no cost to the family, and it's very high-level service, state-of-the-art genomics, where one full genome sequence can, can take the place of hundreds of different individual assets. And so that was launched, again, with the support from the community. We hope to sequence 30,000 patients and maybe a total of 100,000 individuals because we'll include parents and siblings where they're uh, available over the course of seven years. We're already seeing dramatic impacts on families. Uh, one family who've had a condition associated with, with the extended family uh, for over 50 years got a diagnosis. Now, sometimes the diagnosis says, hey, you have this gene alteration, we don't know how to treat it, and, and we don't know uh, why it causes the disease. Uh, families still appreciate that because it gives them something to hold on to, mm -hmm. and it provides research with a starting point. Now we can investigate and study this very rare condition. That's a fantastic uh, program. If you're just joining us, we're here with Dr. Tom Curran and Dr. Stephen Leader and Alex Dinkle talking about the future of pediatric cancer research. And Megan Peters is here via Skype taking your questions. Remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. Megan, I understand we have our first uh, question. We do. The first question is, what are some of the biggest challenges in childhood cancer research? So, Really, the biggest challenge is that childhood cancers are relatively rare compared to adult cancers like breast cancer or prostate cancer. Because they're rare, they're actually hard to study. You really need to collaborate with a lot of organizations to get enough uh, individuals, subjects, to participate in a study that you can get statistically significant results to advance the field. So it kind of mandates that you need to cooperate, uh, hence the participation in the Cancer Center and the NCI Early Phase Clinical Trials Consortium are really essential. And the fact that we can now do this through the Cancer Center really enhances our ability to move the needle forward. And as you study those cancers, you discover that a cancer like childhood leukemia you thought was one disease may be hundreds of diseases. So, Dr. Curran, um, um I would like for you to brag a little bit about a recent uh, development uh, over at uh, Children's Mercy, and that is uh, uh, you, you guys were selected to be part of the NCI's Pediatric Early Phase uh, Clinical Trials uh, Network. Um, 
maybe both of you could tell us uh, what uh, you think that means and why is that so important for our patients. Let me start and I'll pass over to Dr. Leader. But this is really something that the entire team has been working on for a number of years to raise our, our abilities and our profile to the level where we could be strong partners in this consortium. It gives us access to new treatments through, through the uh, consortium trials and it means, means we are contributing our data to that shared database that means children everywhere can potentially benefit. Yeah, and to that I would add um, the fact that uh, uh, you know, this provides us with an opportunity to contribute in other ways as well. You know, I think this, this whole issue of, um, of variability um, in individual patients is something that uh, we need to explore to uh, uh, make sure that uh, each uh, patient receives the amount of uh, um, intervention, whether it's uh, you know, medication, radiation, whatever it is, um, that is um, appropriate for them and minimize the risk of, um, of side effects that, of course, the younger the child, the longer that the consequences of those side effects are going to be um, carried. So there's an opportunity to, to contribute and maybe think about um, um, problems that face everybody in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, I, I want to uh, bring you back in uh, to our uh, conversation. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do um, in, in your current job and kind of how um, uh, you were uh, inspired by your uh, experience uh, as, as a young uh, adolescent with cancer? Um, so at the Cancer Center, I, of course, worked for the uh, regulatory department there and with the investigator-initiated trials. Uh, our main role is typically to assist the principal investigators and the study team in whatever they need during the startup process, um, depending on if a study is an investigative new drug. We help do the submission with the FDA. Um, we are the ones who will read through the protocols very, very um, trying to look at it in a more of a simple, simpler way because we will undoubtedly compose the consent forms that patients will read and sign. We try and make it as easy and understandable so that patients understand not only the risk to benefit ratio that they're going to encounter when participating on the trial, but also some of the adverse effects that may or may not come. Um, throughout the life cycle of the trial, we manage all documents, we ensure study team is trained and held to the expectations that our institutional review board has us at, um, qualities of GCP and ICH, uh, and a number of different things that are very behind the scenes and very important to the aspect of the trial. Um, and because, of course, we are an NCI designated trial or uh, institution, we are held to a certain standard anymore. And I think with that NCI designation, it brings about new opportunities and resources uh, for not only our patients, but also the participants on our trials. Uh, and I think we're lucky to have that designation. Uh, having myself looked at clinical trials from an outsider perspective, it seems almost like a simple thing at times where a doctor or researcher comes up with an idea to better help patients and their disease, give them the treatment they need, and it might help solve the problem. Not again, that's just a basic over, you know, overview. But in reality, being this NCI designated cancer center, it really takes a village to get these trials moving and up and running. Um, working at the clinical trials office for the past three years, it's shown me how serious uh, not only the NCI, but also the FDA, our institutional review boards, and KU and our sponsors and funders take into consideration patient safety and the risk to benefit ratio when it comes to clinical trials. Um, we're not just throwing something out there and hoping that it sticks. It's, it's really taken under a lot of scrutiny and under a lot of consideration, especially investigator initiated trials. Um, we have monthly meetings where new trials are presented in front of a board of 
different doctors um, from different backgrounds, different transdisciplinary um, efforts to help not just one basis of uh, cancer, but all different types. Um, and it goes under the scrutiny from our contracts department, our financial aspects. Um, and we really take into consideration what's going to help our patients going forward when it comes to clinical research. I, I find it so ironic that, um, you know, when, when you were growing up, you were so deeply immersed in this whole process. And now you're on the other side of the table. And it's, I think it's had a, obviously a big impact on, on your life. And, and you certainly bring that experience, uh, you know, to our team and, and, and to our patients. And so for that, we're very grateful. Um, Dr. Curran, um, could you tell us a little bit about the kind of the significance of partnerships that we've established um, and, and bringing Children's uh, um, uh, Research Institute on board as, as a full-fledged consortium partner? So, Roy, as you and I have discussed before, it's all about teamwork and being able to work together with individuals with a range of expertise and perspective. And actually, for me, this has been the most satisfying aspect of coming to Kansas City, working with you and the rest of the Cancer Center membership. We need a, a whole range of expertise looking at the research that we're doing. And you and I have now shared grants between institutions, faculty between institutions. There are really no barriers between us. That allows us to leverage our own expertise to a much greater extent not just with KU, but with the other partners such as STARS and others, and even our, our national or global partnerships. It's as if the Cancer Center gives us a door to open up to recruit uh, and engage the expertise we need for our children. Mm -hmm. And there are some things, I'll give you one example, which it, it, it's rare, but it does happen. We had a little girl, infant, called Clara, who was born with an extremely large um, tumor on her tongue and she was facing extensive surgery and a lifetime of problems because her tongue would have been removed. Because of the genomics collaboration we were able to do a, a, a quick profile and a gene mutation was identified that had been studied in an adult cancer, in lung cancer and there are people around who know how effective this, this kind of drug is and so the option was could we treat this little infant with a drug uh, and instead of that uh, very extensive surgery. And uh, the tumor just melted away uh, in the face of this drug. She went through a course of therapy. She's tumor free. Uh, she looks like any other little uh, girl. She's a three year old right now. So that's an example of taking data from the adult side and applying it to an unbelievably rare infant tumor. Hmm. So Megan, it sounds like we have another question. We do. We have a few questions. The first one, uh, immunotherapy, in particular CAR-T therapy, shows great promise in cancer treatment. Does immunotherapy show as much promise in pediatric cancers? Um, Steve, so, Tom? Let, me, let me jump in. Actually, it shows greater promise. Um, so I was at a hospital in Philadelphia that helped develop the original CAR-T trials and the data that the physician Steve Grupp obtained in pediatric ALL patients really was the data that, that kind of lit the field on fire. I remember the very first patient, Emily Whitehead, uh, who had an unbelievably remarkable recovery. She was not expected to survive and with one treatment, uh, that was it. She, again, is operating like any uh, normal teenage kid. And here in Kansas City, there's a strong collaboration with KU on the development of uh, CAR uh, uh, approaches. And our own uh, Dr. Doug Myers uh, was part of the extended CAR-T trials uh, involving the, the hospital in Philadelphia that led to the NIH approval for the treatment of acute lymphocytic leukemia with CAR-T therapies. So. We, in, in the new research building, have a facility that's designed to expand and enhance our capabilities of developing those kind of therapies. And this is a very close collaboration with KU. In fact, Roy has helped put together a joint endowed chairs so we can go out and recruit the very best and brightest in this area. So that is definitely part of the future of, of both the Cancer Center 
and children's mercy. Next question, Megan. Um, the next question is directed towards Dr. Curran. It says, your specialty is brain cancer, which is a deadly disease. What potential advances are on the horizon? Very good question. And uh, the story in brain cancer is analogous to, to the precision medicine story you heard from Dr. Leader. The more we study these brain cancers, the more gene mutations we identify that offer the possibility of targeted therapies, precision medicine. I spent 20 years helping to develop uh, a precision medicine based on the so-called hedgehog pathway. There's a whole story behind the sonic hedgehog pathway. It, it does exist. And the drug that, that I helped develop that also uh, involved collaborating with uh, Genentech and a biotech company called Curis was approved to treat adult skin cancer um, and is still in a, a late phase clinical trials for children with a brain tumor medullobustoma. So we see more of that in the future using the power of genomics and genetics to uncover that Achilles heel in pediatric brain tumors because ideally we'd like to avoid the surgery, the chemo and the radiation therapy, all of which uh, come at a cost uh, and eliminate these tumors really precisely. Any additional questions, Megan? Yes, there's one more that's been posted. What does the Children's Mercy Research Institute mean to Kansas City, specifically for the residents, region, and community? Dr. Leader, maybe you would like to jump in there as a long-standing member of the community. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, that's true. I will have been at uh, Children's Mercy um, uh, 25 years uh, at the end of June. You know, um, I think the, the uh, Children's Mercy and the Research Institute and the community have had a, um, a, rela a relationship that um, um, I think is really unique. Uh, I came from um, the Hospital for Sick Children in, in Toronto, and, uh, you know, it's a big hospital in a big community. Here we are... Um, uh, a really important part of the uh, the Kansas City community and the support that we receive from the community such as already has been mentioned um, through the uh, the Hall family and the Sunderland family and the um, uh, the big slick uh, um, folks that have their roots in the community here um, that's a really special relationship and so I, I, I really feel that um, as a hospital and as a research institute, we have an obligation to the community to provide the best possible care um, for cancer, but also for all conditions that, um, that we treat um, um, at the hospital and, and through our uh, partnerships and relationships uh, in the, um, the region. And the best possible care uh, comes from not learning about uh, what's new from a textbook, but actually um, creating the knowledge ourselves, and I think that's that's really what um, the 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 really big thing is that we can do for the community is uh, create that new knowledge that's going to provide the best of care to everybody in the in the region. So, when the University of Kansas Cancer Center renewed its NCI designation in 2017, Children's Mercy also became a formal consortium partner. And I want to ask Alex, as a uh, survivor of, of childhood uh, cancer, how does having an NCI designated cancer center in our region uh, really, uh, you know, what does that um, mean uh, to you? And, and what does that mean that uh, Children's Mercy is, is part of this overall effort? You know, as I kind of mentioned, I think it, it puts us under more of a perspective of where we're held to a certain standard now. And it's not saying that we weren't held to a standard before, but it's it's definitely that um, we're looking at things much more clear. And it's a lot more, like I had mentioned, it's numerous meetings of boards, um, people were, different committees are a part of it from our um, ERC or PRMC committees. These are held to certain standards and certain scrutiny of, you know, a trial has to meet certain standards. 
And that is because that NCI designation, you know, demands that we meet a certain standard for our trials and for our patients. I think that over the past three years that I've been here, um, seeing the trials that we participate in, that our investigators bring to the table, we take everything into consideration on how well it's going to benefit our patients long term. Uh, and also how it's going to benefit uh, patients going forward after the trial is completed. We want to make sure that we're having a proper risk benefit ratio for our participants, of course, but trying to prevent any serious adverse effects that can really hinder someone's life going forward. Um, and I think that's the same thing to say with pediatrics. You're doing a trial when someone's younger, you don't know how it's going to affect them when they're in their 20s or 30s. What are the lasting effects from a clinical research trial? So the more that we're held to a standard and the higher quality of our trials, I think that it brings about more hope for the future and better trials and better treatment for patients going forward. So, Alex, I'm going to ask you to expand upon uh, something that you um, mentioned, and that is our uh, pediatric cancer survivorship uh, clinic, which I know uh, that you're, um, uh, you participate in that uh, clinic. Could you tell us about kind of the, the overall purpose uh, of that arrangement and, and how that has specifically uh, uh, benefited uh, you and why it's so important uh, for childhood cancer uh, survivors in this region? Absolutely. Uh, even though I was not a patient at Children's Mercy here in Kansas City, I was treated at another children's hospital in Cincinnati where I was born and raised. Um, I actually heard about the survivorship program from my in-laws who, at the time when the transition clinic was being rolled out, had, there was an article and the Kansas City Star about it of all places. And, you know, with my wife and I moving to Kansas City, they were recommending, hey, you've already had your pediatric cancer. You need to be transitioned to something where they're looking at every aspect of everything that's occurred to you. Um, and so when I went to the transition clinic, Dr. Becky Lowry there, um, her fantastic nurse, Kyle Alsman, who um, I know she goes between KU and Children's Mercy, helping bridge that gap. They look at everything that has happened to me from the amount of radiation exposure, not only from treatment, but from the numerous scans that I've had over the years, um, all the drugs that have gone through me. They're trying to figure out what, what risks I uh, may encounter in the future. Um, of course, I encountered late phase effects in my treatment um, from sudden cardiac arrest when I was 16 um, to even how my brain surgery was performed. I lost nerve function on the right side of my face and don't produce tears in my right eye. So trying to make sure that I help maintain my sight without um, any lasting effects that might hinder my life or stop me from living a normal life as possible. And that transition clinic has given me the capability to live my life without fear um, and has given me capability to kind of live my life as, not only as a survivor, but I think just as someone who's knowledgeable and in charge of his healthcare and held responsible as an adult. And that's an important part, I think, for um, young adults and young teens when they become of age, how do you transition from your parents helping you to being the one who's in charge? And they give you the proper resources to be in charge of your healthcare and your life. And at the end of the day, that's what really matters. And I think that that transition clinic has really helped me find and become who I wanna be. Um, and it's one of the best gifts that I could have ever asked for. That's fantastic, Alex. So, uh, so one last um, uh, question I'm going to ask uh, all, all of you about this. What are, you, uh, what are you most excited about for the future of cancer research in, in pediatrics? I think that we're finally recognizing 
and not just we, but everyone is recognizing that pediatric cancer is more common than we might think. Uh, it's getting the attention and the funding that children and their families deserve. Uh, I think a lot of people, when it comes to pediatrics, forget that this is very much a family oriented cancer. I'm not saying that adult cancer isn't as well, but when it comes to children, uh, you know, this is parents and guardians who are a part of this battle just as much as the child is. Um, I think that with this new research center, having the necessary resources to provide accurate and efficient monitoring uh, and quality control oversight, as well as support and development of trials to ensure that they're benefiting patients, uh, not only in the short term, but the long term, I think it brings about better benefits for patients living longer, healthier lives, hopefully free of late effects and the knowledge that we learn just from what I've seen since I received my treatment 13 years ago. I think the future is as bright as it's ever been for helping patients really live long lives and long beneficial lives. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Leader. Yeah, there are actually two things that um, excite me quite a bit. Uh, the first one is, is one that Dr. Curran alluded to, and that is the fact that as we learn more about the pathways that are involved in pediatric cancer, that there may actually be drugs that um, are going to be um, effective against those, um, uh, those uh, pathways. And I think the, the collaboration that um, we have with the um, uh, Dr. Weir and the Institute for the Advancement of Medical Innovation and the Cancer Center, IAMI, uh, there is a, a real possibility for more repurposing of existing medications for uh, different pediatric tumors. So, so again, increasing the number of uh, small molecules that we can use uh, effectively. The other thing is um, um, something that's rather counterintuitive, and again, investigators um, uh, within the Cancer Center at uh, KU Med and at Children's Mercy looking at the possibility that lower doses might actually be safe and effective is pretty exciting. It's totally counterintuitive to the approach of if you don't see an effect, increase the dose, but um, the fact that uh, lower concentrations of medications may actually selectively target um, pathways in tumor cells and spare um, normal cells is um, um, quite intriguing, counterintuitive, intriguing, and I think that's particularly exciting. Dr. Curran, we're going to let you have the last word. Well, those are all incredibly exciting, and I think we're poised at a really unique time in history where we see broad-based scientific advances all being brought to the cause of pediatric cancer. We're putting kids first. That, to me, is the most exciting thing. But if I had to pick one, I'm pretty excited about the immunotherapeutic prospects. And we have both made this a priority for our development path moving forward. And I say that as a late convert. I used to avoid immunology lectures in college because they were too <laughs> complex and difficult. And uh, turns out I was wrong. <laughs> I'm, right there, I'm right there with you, Dr. Curran. Yes. Well, uh, Dr. Curran and uh, Dr. Leader and, and Alex, uh, thank you so much uh, for being part of this week's uh, episode of Bench to Bedside, and I think uh, for all of us, we would like to express uh, our appreciation uh, to the Hall Family uh, Foundation, to the Sunderland uh, Foundation, and to the Big Slick uh, Foundation for making all of this possible. To learn more about the Children's Mercy Cancer Institute, visit childrensmercy.org forward slash research. That's it for today. Join us next week at 10 a.m. for Bench to Bedside. Thank you.